We live in a toxic world, but we don't have to live in toxic bodies. Every day we are exposed to small but significant amounts of toxic metals. Over the years, these metals accumulate in our tissues, slowly poisoning us. Because the toxic effects of these metals on our health are gradual, we often attribute them to aging, never knowing the real cause of our health problems. In this audio presentation, we will discuss how toxic metals affect our health, how and where we are exposed to them, and how to safely get them out of our bodies. The toxic metals we will address in this presentation are mercury, lead, aluminum, nickel, arsenic, cadmium, uranium, and calcium. You heard correctly, calcium. Under certain conditions, calcium, a mineral required for our health, can become a toxic metal. More on this later. First, let's look at how we are exposed to the other seven toxic metals we just listed and what kinds of problems they can cause. The first toxic metal we will look at is mercury. Mercury is one of the most deadly substances known to man. It accumulates in the brain, nervous system, heart, kidneys and endocrine glands, and can cause depression, autoimmune disorders, memory loss, tremors, anemia, and heart attacks, among other things. Studies done by the University of Calgary have shown that when mercury comes into contact with nerve tissue, it can actually melt the myelin sheath right off the nerve, causing the nerve to shrivel in a matter of seconds. What is even more unbelievable is that this highly toxic metal is actually put right into our mouths in the form of dental fillings. If you have silver fillings in your mouth, you may be interested to know that these silver fillings actually contain as much as 50% mercury by weight. In fact, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, there's enough mercury in one silver filling to force the closing of a 10-acre lake. The practice of using mercury in dental fillings began in 1833 when a pair of French entrepreneurs introduced it to American dentists. Most dentists initially dismissed the idea as dangerous because the poisonous effects of mercury were already well known. Those few dentists who chose to use mercury in dental fillings were called quacks. This derogatory term was an abbreviation of the word quacksilber, which was German for quicksilver, the common name for mercury at the time. Over time, however, using mercury in fillings became the norm, not the exception. And those dentists today who choose to remove mercury from their patients' mouths are themselves called quacks. While modern dentists claim that the mercury in silver fillings doesn't leak into the body, Scientific tests show that each mercury filling in our mouth releases on average 17 micrograms of mercury into the body every day. But fillings aren't the only source of mercury in our lives. Mercury is also found in adhesives, air conditioner filters, cosmetics, fabric softeners, felt, floor waxes and polishes, laxatives, seafood, talcum powder, and tattoos. 150 years ago, the only people exposed to mercury at toxic levels were the hat makers, because the felt they shaped into hats contained high levels of this toxic element. Their continual exposure to mercury destroyed their brains, causing them to slowly go insane. This gave rise to the expression, mad as a hatter. These days, we are all exposed to mercury, and with senility and other mental disorders on the rise, we should ask ourselves, to what degree is mercury to blame? The next toxic metal we will address is lead. Lead is found in chocolate, canned foods, newspapers, toothpaste, cosmetics, plastics, batteries, gasoline, old paint, insecticides, pottery, ceramics, and worst of all, soldered pipes. This means that every glass of water we drink and every shower or bath we take increases our lead exposure. Lead accumulates in the brain, liver, bones, kidneys, and spleen, 
where it has many negative effects, but none more insidious than its ability to alter behavior and intelligence. For each 30 micrograms of lead in our bloodstream, we can expect a 10-point drop in our IQ, as well as a decreased ability to deal with new environments and social situations. Let's turn the toxic metal discussion to aluminum. Public water utilities universally use aluminum to remove debris suspended in the water supply. This is because when aluminum is added to water, it causes the little bits of dirt that are naturally suspended in the water to stick together and fall out of solution, making them easier to remove. This process is called flocculation. Unfortunately, this process continues in our own bloodstream. You see, our bloodstream also has little things floating around in it, like red and white blood cells, antibodies, hormones, and platelets, to name a few. Flocculation may be a good idea in our drinking water, but when our bloodstream flocculates, it can cause serious problems, such as strokes and heart attacks, for example. Aluminum is used to get the dirt out of the drinking water, but what is used to get out the aluminum? I would personally prefer a little dirt or sand in my water than toxic aluminum. Another common source of aluminum is antiperspirants. When aluminum is applied to the sweat glands under the arms, it literally glues them closed, preventing toxins from naturally leaving the body in your sweat. In women, once under the arms, the aluminum goes through the lymph nodes right to the breasts. It is likely that the high rate of breast cancers and other breast disorders we are seeing is to some degree a result of women unwittingly poisoning their own breasts on a daily basis. Other sources of aluminum include baking powder, feminine hygiene products, toothpaste, baby formula, antacids, and of course aluminum foil and pots and pans. Aside from its effects in the breasts, aluminum also accumulates in the skin, bones, brain and kidneys, and can cause Alzheimer's disease, memory problems, dementia, aphasia, ataxia, convulsions, and anemia. It may be hard to fathom, but the average person will eat and drink over three pounds of aluminum in his or her lifetime. That's the equivalent of 292 square feet of aluminum foil. Is it any wonder that Alzheimer's disease is on the rise? Let's move to nickel. Nickel is found in stainless steel cutlery, pots and pans, coins, dental fillings, and batteries. Given its use in cutlery and cookware, we are all exposed to nickel with each meal. Each fork and spoonful of food carries a trace of nickel with it. It accumulates in the bones, kidneys, liver, lungs, immune system, sinuses, and the brain where it causes genetic disease and cancer. One of the most common problems associated with nickel exposure is skin conditions. Many people with chronic skin conditions are actually experiencing chronic nickel toxicity, and no amount of skin creams or lotions will ever work until this offending toxic metal. The next metal we will address is arsenic. Arsenic is found in cigarette smoke, laundry detergents, beer, seafood, colored chalk, wallpaper, wine, and drinking water. Thus, we are exposed to this poison in the first and second hand smoke we inhale, the beverages we drink, and even the clothes we wear. It accumulates in the kidneys, liver and lungs, and it causes headaches, mental confusion, and fatigue. Let's talk about cadmium. Cadmium is found in soft drinks, cigarette smoke, water softeners, rubber, motor oil, pesticides, fungicides, carpets, rust proofing, silver polish, and plastics. Cadmium accumulates in the kidneys, prostate and eyes, and can cause fatigue, high blood pressure, hair loss, edema, arthritis, and impotence. The last of the traditional toxic metals we will discuss is uranium. Uranium is a radioactive element that causes disease and cancer everywhere it appears. There have been over 2,000 nuclear detonations on this planet since Hiroshima, 
each one sending radioactive dust into the atmosphere for future generations to inhale, not to mention toxic plumes from disasters like the meltdown at Chernobyl. The most recent appearance of uranium is in munitions used in the Iraq War. So far, an estimated 2,000 tons of uranium have been used in Iraq, turning that country into a radioactive nightmare that future generations will pay for in horrible birth defects and cancer. Our soldiers are also breathing this uranium dust in and bringing it back to their families in their bodies and their clothes. The increased number of birth defects found in the children of Iraq war veterans is frightening. You don't have to be in Iraq, however, to be exposed to the effects of this uranium dust. After all, the world shares just one atmosphere. Given time, the uranium that is used in Iraq travels as a toxic dust around the world and ends up in our own lungs. The fact of the matter is, no matter where we live and what we do, if we eat food, drink water, and breathe air, we are being exposed to toxic metals every day. Once a toxic metal gets into the body, it is very difficult to get it out again. This is because these toxic metals aren't just floating around in the bloodstream or sitting in the fatty tissues. They actually become part of our body at a cellular level. This happens because, to your body, toxic metals look just like other elements, elements we need. This is due to similarities in atomic size and electron configuration. Thus, rather than recognizing a toxic metal as a poison and getting rid of it, the body instead tries to use it like a nutritional element, and this is where the problems start. Take mercury, for example. To the body, mercury looks just like the nutritional mineral selenium. Since most people are chronically deficient in selenium, when a molecule of mercury floats by in the bloodstream, the body thinks, oh good, some selenium, I need that, and it gobbles it right up. Of course, mercury may look like selenium, but it doesn't act like selenium. In fact, in many ways, it is the exact opposite of selenium. Once the mercury is incorporated into the body, it is free to exert its toxic influence 24 hours a day, generating free radicals, melting nerves, and suppressing immune function. In this same manner, lead is mistaken for calcium, cadmium is mistaken for zinc, and aluminum, nickel, and uranium are mistaken for magnesium. It is this insidious ability of toxic metals to trick your body into incorporating them into your tissues that makes them so difficult to get rid of. All right, we've covered the traditional toxic metals, toxic metals. Now, let's talk about calcium. In the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that under certain circumstances, calcium can become a toxic metal. Let's discuss exactly how this happens. Unlike the previous metals we have discussed, calcium is not toxic by virtue of what it is, but rather because of where it can go. In a healthy body, 99% of the calcium is found in the bones and teeth. Unfortunately, as we age, our bones and teeth lose this calcium, becoming weak and brittle. This process is known as osteoporosis and tooth decay. But did you ever wonder where all this lost calcium goes? It goes into the internal organs. The most commonly known example of this toxic displaced calcium is the formation of kidney stones. Annually, nearly 3 million visits to the doctor and 600,000 visits to the emergency room in the United States are due to kidney stones. As anyone who's ever had one can tell you, Passing a kidney stone can be one of the most painful experiences of a person's life. Even if calcium in the kidney doesn't form stones, it can decrease the filtering ability of the kidneys, which increases toxins in your bloodstream. Another commonly known example of calcification is gallstones. Symptomatic gallstones account for more than 600,000 hospitalizations, and more than 500,000 operations each year in the United States. Most people who have gallstones, however, never know it. Even small gallstones that do not produce the kind of obvious symptoms that make one seek medical attention can cause problems. 
gallstones can block the excretions of bile from the gallbladder into the intestines. This can cause constipation, poor digestion and absorption, and a buildup of toxins in the liver and bloodstream. Well, that takes care of the two commonly known results of calcification. Now let's look at some of the less known results of calcification in the body. Calcium also accumulates in the muscles as we age. This causes tightness in the muscles and in the extreme leads to a condition known as fibromyalgia. If you feel the muscles of a small child you will see that they are soft and pliable. As we age, however, our muscles become tenser and filled with knots. This is the calcification process at work. Calcium can also deposit in the arteries. This process is called arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. When the calcium deposits up along the entire length of an artery, it can cause poor blood flow and high blood pressure. When it builds up in one spot in particular, it can cause a heart attack or a stroke. Every day, calcium accumulates not only in the large arteries in the heart and major organs, but also in the tiny capillaries as well. These tiny blood vessels are so small that blood cells have to pass by single file in order to travel through them. Even a little calcification in these vessels is enough to stop blood cells from flowing through them. While a blockage of one or two of these tiny vessels is of no great concern, over time the cumulative effect can be catastrophic. As organs lose blood flow in what amounts to thousands of little local heart attacks a day, a person's health and vitality are compromised. Another place calcium accumulates is in the brain. The technical term for this is acervuli, but it is more commonly referred to as brain sand. This gradual calcification of the brain is partly responsible for the loss in mental function as we age. Calcium also accumulates in the eyes, the breasts, and the prostate. In fact, the only place that calcium doesn't seem to accumulate as we age is in the bones and teeth where it belongs. The average man and woman lose 1% of their bone mass per year, starting at age 35, until by age 70, 30 to 40 percent of the bone mass is gone. And where did it go? Into our internal organs. This gradual calcification is, however, not inevitable. The same process that we can use to remove toxic metals, such as mercury and lead, can also be used to pull this toxic calcium from our bodies. In fact, this process will not only remove toxic calcium, but it can actually put it back into the bones and teeth where it belongs. So, how can all this be done? It can be done with a process called chelation. Chelation uses a synthetic amino acid called EDTA to go in and bind to these toxic metals and misplaced calcium and physically pull them out of the body. The EDTA molecule has a very strong affinity for these metals, and when introduced into the body, it attaches to these toxins. Once attached to EDTA, these toxins are made water-soluble, and they wash right out of the body. Another way to think about it is to think of a greasy dish. All the hot water in the world won't remove all the grease, but add a little bit of soap, and that does the trick. This is because soap is what makes grease water-soluble. Add the soap and the grease washes right off. It's the same for EDTA and toxic metals. Add a little bit of EDTA and the toxic metals wash right out. Nearly 10 million treatments of EDTA chelation have been prescribed over the last 50 years. In that time, EDTA has proven its safety and efficacy. EDTA is currently on the FDA's GRAS list. This acronym stands for Generally Recognized as Safe and is the seal of approval given to ingredients that have shown to be safe for daily use. EDTA has traditionally been given as a three-hour intravenous drip. This is because EDTA is a protein and if taken orally it will be digested 
and altered by the stomach acids and digestive enzymes. Chelation by IV is a time-consuming, expensive, and invasive procedure. Fortunately, there is another way to get EDTA into the body, and that is by suppository. This method has been used for nearly 20 years and is considered to be just as effective as intravenous administration. Chelation by suppository is safe, convenient, and very effective. Magnesium dipotassium EDTA suppositories are now available without a prescription. If you're concerned about your level of toxic metal exposure and body calcification, contact the health care provider who gave you this CD. Remember, we live in a toxic world, but with chelation, we don't have to live in a toxic body.